Hello people, I know why you're here. You looked at your textbooks, so a lot of maths on this topic. Didn't feel like going through everything by yourself. Welcome, and sorry, because I will eventually be showing math, but trust me, if you watch until the end of this video, you won't regret having spent the time. But make sure you stay focused, okay? I'm gonna show every single detail on retarded potentials and Jeffy Mankel's equations in a comprehensible way. The concept of retardation and Jeffy Mankel's equations in electrodynamics is very important. So what is it about? Say Green is trying to tell Blue that he's 20 years old. But the thing is, the two are far apart from each other that it'll take one year for the sound to travel. Now Blue hears Green's voice. And when he heard the voice, he was also 20 years old. He thinks Green has the same age as him. Let me ask you, are they same age? Of course not. Green is one year older than Blue. So what was the problem? The problem was that one year has passed since Green said he's 20 years old. That message was an old message. The expired, retarded message. Now, there's a scalar potential and an observer plays on a graph. The scalar potential has a coordinate R0, T0, so the subscript 0 meant original position and original time. And let's say the scalar potential was V0 at the moment of T0. This information will now be delivered to the observer. And I'll denote the distance as capital R. It'll take some time for the message to be delivered. Now, the observer receives the information. Actually, in real life experiments, we cannot really measure potentials. So we measure the fields instead. I'm just letting you know. But for now, let's just say that we can somehow measure it. Would it be certain that the scalar potential that the observer measured has the same value as the scalar potential over there at this moment? What if the scalar potential has changed after the information was sent? Then in that case, the value that the observer measured would not represent the scalar potential at this moment. So this expression is not realistic. Yes, what you have learned up till now in school was never realistic. We must be aware that we always get retarded information, since all information takes time to travel. So the potential should actually be a function of not only space, but also time. So whatever we measure it in here, r, t, is actually about the charge at r0, t0 in the past. So there's this time difference, r over c. Because as the electromagnetic information is traveling at the speed of light, it will take R over C to reach the observer. So the past time T0 is equal to the time right now minus R over C. Remember this, okay? So in the past, you learned that the expression for the scalar potential is this. But now you know that this expression makes more sense. This is the potential value being measured right now. But that value doesn't actually represent the potential right now, but it corresponds to the potential that existed in the past. This obtained value is called the retarded potential. Again, in real life, one will always be obtaining the retarded potential, not the current potential. And the retarded potential is the potential that was formed by the charge in the past not the charge at this moment. What we have changed in the expression is this charge density. We have just replaced the new charge density with an old charge density, okay? But now, can we simply replace it like that? Is that the end of the story and is everyone happy with that? No, physicists won't be happy if it ends like this. There's an important task that must always be done in theoretical physics. Most professors never explicitly mention this to students, but when we find new equations or modify some of the existing equations, we have to always make sure that the new change does not contradict with other known or proven laws. If we bring a new equation and that equation forces us to change all the other laws, it will be a disaster. So we just replace the new charge density with the old charge density in the scalar potential, right? 
What I'm saying is that we must make sure that didn't affect other laws. Let's think about other laws that contain a scalar potential in their equations. As an example, there's this wave equation. I explained about this equation in the previous video, single Maxwell's equation. So we must make sure that this equation is still valid even with the change that we made. This is a very important task in theoretical physics. All right, I'll put the equation aside. Here comes the math. You gotta focus now, okay? Since there's a del square in front of a scalar potential, let's apply one del first. You see, this charge density is a function of a spatial variable, r. And of course, this capital R in the denominator is a spatial variable as well. So that means we have to apply the product rule from calculus. So take the derivative of this one and then take the derivative of this one as well. Okay, let's take a look at this first term. I'm gonna recall chain rule. You remember how the chain rule works? We multiply by one and then swap the two denominators, right? So we're gonna do that to the charge density. Let's just consider the x component of the derivative. Del is just a differential operator, so d over dx rho in the x direction. Let's not forget the direction, x hat. And now I'm going to multiply by 1, which is dt0 over dt0. Then switch the two denominators, dx and dt0. Just to remind you again, t0 was the current time minus the travel time. The front one is now the time derivative, so we can just say time derivative of the charge density by putting a dot on rho and dt0 over dx in the x direction. Since del operator is this, that means we can now write rho dot times del of the t0. And what was that t0 again? t minus r over c, right? Since the del operator doesn't contain time derivative, this t will be gone, and we're going to be left with d over dr of minus r over c. So in the end, we get minus 1 over c rho dot in the r hat direction. Okay, we just operated the first term. Now let's look at the second term, this one, del of 1 over r. Well, d over dr of 1 over r is just minus 1 over r squared, right? So second term was easy. And we arrive at this expression. So far good? You remember this was del squared and not just del. So we should apply the del operator once again from here. We have two spatial variables on both terms. So now we'll have them separated into four terms by the product rules. Let's look at the first term again. You know, before we already got that del of rho is minus 1 over c rho dot in the r direction, right? In the similar way, del of rho dot should be minus 1 over c rho dot dot, so second time derivative in the r direction. You can try to derive that by yourself to check. Now, in the second term, del is attached to r hat over r. Now, pay attention to this. These two are both 1 over r. But this one was just a scalar value, and this one has a direction, which means it's a vector. You know, del operator becomes gradient operator when it's attached to a scalar quantity, and it becomes divergence operator when it's attached to a vector quantity, right? So this one isn't just the derivative, but we should use this formula, divergence of a vector in spherical coordinates. So, divergence of r hat over r should have only the first term survived, and this is just 1 over r squared. You remember the previous one was minus 1 over r squared, right? This one is just 1 over r squared, so there is a difference. The third term is del rho. We already derived that. Now the last term. This one looks straightforward, but it's actually not. I can tell you that some of you may actually face a question related to this term on a school test. So divergence of r hat over r squared, what about it? Can't we just do the same thing using the divergence formula? But this time, r squared over r squared will cancel each other, such that this will be a derivative of 1, which should equal to 0. But is that it? 
No. What if the case was r being equal to 0? This r squared over r squared would have been 0 over 0, which is undefined. This doesn't make sense. Then what should we do about it? We have to actually bring another theorem to derive this term. The divergence theorem, or sometimes it's called the Gauss's theorem. But there are just too many Gauss's theorems, so I prefer calling it divergence theorem. Let's replace the vector a with what we have on the right hand side of the equation. dA is just the area component. So in the spherical coordinates, it should be r squared sine theta d theta d phi in the r hat direction. You know, we had another r hat at the front, so this is r hat dot r hat, which becomes unity. So in the end, we're left with this, which equals to 4 pi. You know how to interpret this, right? I don't need to explain you. So if the right hand side is equal to 4 pi, that means the left hand side of the theorem should also be 4 pi. And if I move 4 pi to the other side, it's going to be 1 over 4 pi integral of our last term over the volume being equal to 1. Now, I don't know if you have learned this, but there's a 3D delta function that goes like this. If you integrate a 3D delta function over a volume, it's 1. This means our divergence of r hat over r squared must be equal to 4 pi times the 3D delta function. You see? It's not always 0. So this is the actual solution to the last term. Alright, let's gather all that we have derived and rewrite this expression. So by rearranging this nicely, you'll see that there are two terms that can be cancelled. So we are left with only the rest two terms. So let's separate the terms like this. And let me retrieve this second order time derivative. So I removed the double dot from row and also took out 1 over c squared and put back in this 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. I haven't touched the second integral yet. Now, doesn't this one look familiar to you? This is the expression for the retarded scalar potential, right? So it's just 1 over c squared second time derivative of the retarded scalar potential. That's great. Now let's look at the second integral. Those 4 pi's cancel out, and by integrating the delta function, we'll just have this 1 over epsilon naught rho. We could also replace 1 over c squared with epsilon naught mu naught. So in the end, we'll have this expression. And this expression is precisely the wave equation that we had. So the retarded potential still satisfies the wave equation. Great! Now physicists are happy. So, we have a scalar potential re-expressed like this. And we could also have the vector potential re-expressed in the same way. And that was quite simple discoveries. But we haven't talked about the fields yet. Would it be just re-expressing them like this as well? Nope, fields don't work that way. Fields are a bit complicated. You know, electric field can be expressed in terms of scalar and vector potential. Let's derive a retarded electric field using the retarded scalar potential and the retarded vector potential. Everything's retarded. <laughs> Let's look at the second term first. Minus time derivative of the vector potential. Well, it's just a time derivative, so we just put a dot on the current vector. And again, using c squared equal to 1 over epsilon naught mu naught, we could rewrite the term like this. Now let's look at the first term. Negative gradient of the scalar potential. We have already derived the gradient of the V, but now it's just there's a negative sign attached. Let's recall our previously derived expression. We don't need to do this again. So combining these two, we'll have this well-organized expression. This is the retarded electric field. It is long and look more complicated than the retarded potentials. All right, now let's derive a retarded magnetic field using this expression, curl of a vector potential. So I have the retarded vector potential ready here. So curl of the retarded vector potential 
we have a vector j over scalar r. So we have to bring up this vector identity, which goes like this. Curl of a scalar times vector is equal to the scalar times curl of the vector minus the vector cross gradient of the scalar. The expression will be like this. Take a moment and see if it makes sense to you. Now the first term, curl of the vector j, is this in the matrix form. Let's have a look at the x component as an example. It's going to be djz over dy minus djy over dz in x direction, right? Here again, we're going to apply the chain rule, multiplying each term by 1, which is dt0 over dt0. Then we can arrive at time derivative of jz times dt0 over dy minus time derivative of jy times dt0 over dz in the x direction. So by rewrapping it, we could have del t not cross j dot instead of the curl of the j. Like why are we even doing this? I'm going to explain that later. Now remember t not was t minus r over c, right? So again, the t will disappear as a del operator doesn't contain the time derivative. So we'll be just left with minus 1 over c r hat. And you know how we can get rid of the minus sign by simply switching the order in the cross product? So it's just 1 over c j dot cross r hat. Alright, we're almost there guys. We still have the second term, but you know what that one was? We have already derived it. It's just minus 1 over r squared r hat. Okay, so let's put them together now. We'll have this expression. Make sure you follow these expressions, okay? You can pause the video for a moment and check all this. In the end, we'll have a somewhat nicely organized expression for the retardant magnetic field. So, the retarded fields look a bit more complicated than the retarded potentials. Do you have to memorize this? I don't think so. But you still need to roughly know how these are derived, okay? As a conclusion, these are the newly derived retarded fields. And if you think about it, these are pretty much the time-dependent version of Coulomb's law and Biot-Zauer law. Makes sense, right? And these are Jeff Emanko's equations. Whew, great job following until here. But we got one final task to do as a theorist. What was it again? Making sure that they don't contradict with other existing laws. Well, this time is quite simple. Let's just think about a static case. So, what does it mean by a static case? When the time derivative of the physical quantities are zero, right? We had this Jeff Emanko's equations. Try to get rid of all the time derivative terms. We'll be only left with single terms. And what is this? We're simply back to the original field expressions. How cool is this? It makes all sense. And this was actually why we did all those chain rules and product rules, so we can separate those time derivative terms and cancel them for the static case. So Jeff Emanko's field equations are very realistic equations. That is great. But did this help us to find anything in physics? Yes. Jeff Emanko's equations basically proved that in electromagnetic wave, Electric field and magnetic field are always perpendicular to each other. Oh, you already knew this, eh? Well, this wasn't an obvious thing in the past. So yeah, I'll make another video to show how Jeff Emanko's equations prove this orthogonality between the electric field and the magnetic field. I hope you like my detailed explanations and please like and subscribe to my channel. It motivates me a lot. Bye.